Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's um, a real pleasure to be back here. It was about a year ago, or maybe a little longer, that I was here and, and did a talk on sturgeon. Um, since my retirement, I've been involved in a couple of different nonprofit uh, activities, and one of those is X Expedition. Um, we have a movie tonight that we took aboard the made aboard the ship and uh, aboard our uh, our crossing. What I want to do is present a movie. Um, the movie that we produced as part of our, our journey across uh, from Canary Islands to Martinique. And that took place in 2014. And I want to, though, before that, uh, give you some background. Hopefully not, uh, not take a lot of time. The movie's about 40 minutes long. It's, it's fast-paced. I hope it doesn't put you to sleep. Um, but I think a little background, and I certainly don't need to be telling uh, a room full of Missouri River trash pickers about, about the problem with trash. Um, what we are a little more surprised about is that it's become now as big of a problem in the oceans. Uh, we think of the oceans as just so vast, and the fact that not only um, are we able to literally dip into places in the middle of the ocean and pull up bits of plastic, um, but that there are big eddies out there, the gyres that are just collecting all this trash that's, not, that's coming down our rivers, really, and, and getting into the ocean. So there's definitely a connection here to the rivers and um, it won't be hard for you all to, to see that. As I said, we, uh, the first expedition was in 2014. I was on that very first expedition. Since then, there have been a number of them, and you can see them here on this map. Um, and we can talk about the venture I'll be on this year for X Expedition at the end. This was the brainchild of two British women both of them uh, heavy into sailing and also very fierce advocates for ocean health. Uh, Lucy Gilliam and Emily Penn. Lucy is um, a marine, so uh, actually a soil um, microbiologist, and Emily is a, um, is a marine advocate now, but trained originally in, in architecture and sustainable architecture. Um, both very dynamic women, and they had this, this idea that we, we need, and this idea maybe in the 2013, 2012, they wanted to combine the adventure of sailing and, and make it meaningful, um, and to be able to help um, help spread the word about what was going on in the oceans. And I came up with the idea of X Expedition, all women voyages that would bring together groups of people that had from all over the world, from different backgrounds, not just scientists, but from all over. And what they wanted to address was this huge problem of plastic in the ocean. Now here's some numbers that are just mind-boggling. Think about that we produce, and these, these data are actually from 2010, but, but the, the world globally, we were, we're producing about 270, 275 million tons of plastic, and about 275 million goes into the waste stream every year. So we're, it's, it's, about, it's about the same, about the annual production and, and what's actually being thrown away. A friend of mine um, is the originator of, of this graph. In fact, she was on the first voyage with me and has since published this in, in science. Um, and it's gotten a lot of attention, a lot of attention by the UN Environment Program that now has, has said that ocean plastics, marine plastics, 
is as big of a problem as climate change. That just blows me away, because we all know how big climate change is. <laughs> but marine plastic is, is a huge, huge deal, and, and there are um, agencies all over the world now trying to tackle this. So of all that, what she did was she looked at um, the plastic production, and then she looked at, well, how much of this is actually getting into the oceans? And she figured out how much is being produced coastally, or used coastally, I should say, and that's about 100 million tons. And then she figured out how much is um, escaping recycling and the proper disposal, landfill, incineration, how much is escaping your, your treatment of, of trash, of plastic trash. And so she estimated, finally, that about 8 million tons annually is getting into the ocean. Interestingly, so this is, and you can find this along the coasts in many, many places. I was in Senegal in 2015, and the coast looked like this. It was horrific. Um, what they're finding is that this plastic comes in through, mainly through rivers or through waste streams in big cities, and gets caught in these eddies, these big gyres that are currents, that are our ocean currents. And they're being carried to five of these big ocean currents and, um, and, and deposited there. They basically sit there and they circle. Some of them are the size of France, the size of Texas. They're enormous. And they're, they're just a huge problem um, that people are now trying to, to tackle. How do, how do we get this plastic out? Because it could be there almost indefinitely. So this is what you might see in those areas, or you might not see it at all. Um, in some places, yeah, you're seeing big chunks. But in many cases, it, the UV light from, from the um, sun, the abrasion and tumbling in the, in the ocean, the salt, all these um, physical factors break the plastic down. It just wears down and it breaks up into smaller and smaller pieces. So in some cases, it gets you know, trapped in its entirety. In other cases, you're seeing just tiny little bits. But this is, this is the kind of thing that we saw almost in the middle of the ocean. You're also seeing a lot of um, what they call, um, uh, well, nets and buoys and all the fishing gear that's just come loose or that the fishermen have, the big trawlers uh, have lost at sea. And of course, those ghost fish and they capture a lot of the wildlife. That's also a, another huge problem. There have been a lot of campaigns to try and get rid of the small stuff. Not just the big stuff, but the small stuff too. The microbeads, you've probably heard about it because it's just been all over the news. Um, the small spheres of plastic that are in the cosmetic products that are in many of the soaps and shampoos, abrasives, um, scrubs, these are um, un really unnecessary because there are natural substitutes, but they go right down the drain and right through the, the sewage system and right out into the, the ocean. Um, via the waste stream and via rivers. So this is another source of plastic that we're very concerned about. And then the micro fleece. Oh my God. We thought that it was bad when it, we were dealing with these tiny spheres that you can barely see. But now Patagonia and many others are doing studies that their products, whenever you wash them, 250,000 fibers or more are coming loose. Tiny fibers, fibers that can be ingested by 
the smallest of life out there, the zooplankton, the, the animals at the base of the food chain. And, and the bigger pieces of plastic we're finding in birds, we're finding in fish. So it really has become ubiquitous and a problem, but we really don't understand yet. The science world doesn't understand what the consequences are, don't understand what the, um, the, the effects are going to be. So there's a lot of study, and part of that is why the UN has declared this to be an enormous problem. Not only that, here are a couple of other little factoids. There's always this rain of debris going to the bottom of the oceans. Well, in the deepest trenches now in the oceans, they're able to core down and they're finding microplastics in the sediments. So this, this material is starting to just disappear into the bottoms of the oceans. They're finding lanternfish that live at very deep depths of the ocean have microplastics in their guts. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, got, it's got enormous ramifications. Um, and these little beautiful, really, if you look at them under the microscopes, the fibers, the little tiny pieces of plastic, this is actually plastic I collected in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, they're like little tiny life rafts. And they colonize with bacteria, potentially pathogens, that's now a concern, as has been in the past, the dust that's been coming over from Africa, um, that has come, come laden with different um, pathogens that have influenced the health of corals. Now we have plastic that's carrying potentially pathogenic organisms, but also chemicals, chemicals that absorb to the, the surface of these, these tiny pieces of plastic, then are consumed, what does that mean? As also as part of this voyage, so we, we took this voyage to be able to document plastic in the ocean, to have people that were um, not, not um, professional scientists, to have them involved in, in research, and then to take that information back to their communities, their networks, and let people know what's going on from firsthand experience with, this, with the plastic. We also wanted to tie this into what's going on with, with our own body, uh, especially as women and bearers of children, um, and pa people, women pass on contaminants onto their offspring. Um, we're very interested in what our own body burdens are. So each one of the women on this, this trip took their blood and had it analyzed for various contaminants. Many of the same contaminants that are um, involved in plastic production or are associated with um, endocrine disruption. And um, we'll talk more in, in later on if that's, if that's an interest um, about what the results were of, of that. So we had the two things. We had this making the unseen seen, making what is out in that vast ocean, and, and you can't see. You can see some of it floating, but so much of it you can't. And, and what's in our bodies. That was the theme of this, um, this expedition. So I think um, now we can, we can start the film. The oceans are fundamental to the survival of the Earth. Home to hundreds of thousands of species, without the oceans, our world would cease to exist. Yet we continue to pollute them with plastics, toxics and waste, harming the environment and in turn, endangering ourselves. We are a team of 14 women, scientists, activists, designers, sailors, but most importantly, mothers, sisters, daughters, friends. Women with hope for a healthier future. 
We are X Expedition, on a mission to make the unseen seen. In April 2014, we met for the first time in London to have our bloods taken for body burden testing. Part of the UN Safe Planet campaign, this testing aims to show the various toxics and chemicals in our bodies, making people aware of their presence and potential for affecting not only their own health, but the health of future generations. Our samples would be sent to Dr. Anna Carmen in Sweden, and we would receive our results after setting sail in November. Emily explained the issue of plastics and toxics in the ocean, describing how plastic breaks down into microplastics over time and act as sponges for toxics and chemicals. These then slowly make their way back to us through the food chain as well as consumption and use of cosmetics and personal care products. We spoke about the effects of those plastics and toxics on both human and environmental health, and how we wanted to use this expedition to make this unseen problem seen by as many people as possible. We spent the next day brainstorming, planning, sharing ideas, hopes and fears for our adventure together. Knowing the next time we would see each other, we would be setting sail across the Atlantic. In November 2014, we made our way to Lanzarote in the Canary Islands, our starting point for our journey across the Atlantic Ocean to Martinique in the Caribbean. With the addition of new crew, this would be the first time we would all meet after over a year of planning. As we arrived in the marina, it was amazing to see Sea Dragon, our new home, for the first time. A 72-foot sailing vessel specifically designed for science and run by Pangaea Explorations, she was a sight to behold. We were sailing as part of Jimmy Cornell's Atlantic Odyssey, and our first stop was to meet with his daughter Doina and discuss the events for the coming week before setting sail. Art workshops, beach cleanups, forums, presentations and school visits. We were ready. Time for the whole crew to arrive.
What do you think about using plastic to make art? Uh, I think it's really a really good idea because I mean, you're reusing other people's garbage. So at least you're putting it to good use. Later that day, we reflected on this as we headed to the landfill. It's like an important moment because they will put it in the news that, that mm. you've been here and that, yeah. you know, because they want to rub a little bit of the, you goodness. know, of the, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah the goodness <laughs> of the project. Okay. I'm all for that. Interesting. I think mm. the, these, the people with the power are the ones that need to hear the message the most. Yeah. As we toured the site, for those who had never been to a landfill before, it was an overwhelming experience. It truly brought home the importance and urgency of our mission. Worldwide, we produce 2.5 billion metric tons of waste every year, and 275 million of this is plastic. We now know, through the research of one of our crew members, Dr. Jenna Jambeck, that over 8 million metric tons makes its way into the oceans. What is this, the uh, boat traffic? It's a, it's about, no, it's about the plastics on the, oh, okay. in the water. And it's a map sort of showing how they actually move around. We made our way to do a beach cleanup on the northern side of Lanzarote. We took with us children from the Atlantic Odyssey and showed them different apps they could use while crossing, like the Marine Debris Tracker. Well, so some of these are larger pieces of plastic that have turned into fragments, but then some of these are pre-production plastic. So this is a plastic nurdle, they call it, and this is what you would then take a lot of these and melt down into the resin that you would mold into plastic items. I'm going to try and gather up as many as possible and walk along and sort of try to get a rough density estimate. I have not seen this it's so obvious in the rack line before. This is really when you're like, what are we doing? Colleagues, yeah. They told me, they explained me, and well, um, um, it's amazing. It's so great, and hopefully everything goes all right, and you show us how we ha must handle in the future this beautiful planet, and do your your best because we need you. On November 14th, two days before setting sail, the whole crew finally moved on board Sea Dragon. As we all got settled in, Lucy and Emily planned out the provision list for the crossing. In addition to the sponsored food we had been provided by Fish Forever, Organico, and Dove's Farm in the UK, we also bought plenty of fruit and veg to last for much of the journey. How many tea bags do we need for the trip? 900 <laughs> cups of tea. <laughs> After everything was stowed, we went up on deck for our domestic and safety briefings. So what is this work? This is how uh, we tether ourselves down at night time. So when we're doing night watches, we've got a constant tether so that we don't fall overboard. Uh -huh.
please, 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 please do not puke in the trash can because we have to carry that around for the next three weeks. Uh, it'd be better for you to puke next to the trash bag than to actually puke in it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but hopefully you don't need it, but we do have a few buckets that we can tie uh, next to your bunk. This is our VHF radio in the middle of the ocean. Um, it's going to be infrequent that, that people will be able to hear us on this. Um, but if there's a you know a rescue nearby or a boat nearby or something, then it's always VHF is the way that you can communicate with people near you. The, work, the boat were to sink out from under us and we did not have time to deploy the life, life rafts. As the boat sinks out from under the life rafts, um, when it gets to a particular level of pressure, it will, um, the hydrostatic release will go, so then the life raft is then floating free on the surface with Sea Dragon not nearby. Winches basically allow us to do things that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise, man or woman. As we counted down the hours to setting sail, we all used our last opportunity to send emails to friends and family, saying farewell to life on land for however long the crossing would take us. As the morning dawned on the day we set sail, Emily ran through our watch system and the logbook that we would complete every hour on the hour throughout our crossing. Obviously, as you figured, there's lots of us living in a really, really tiny space because we've got the rotating watches. Um, it's kind of nice because the, this group actually feels a lot smaller. But, you know, attitude on board um, makes all the difference. You know, the difference between us just crossing the Atlantic um, and achieving what we want to do and the difference with actually this being a trip that stays with us for the rest of our lives as this group and makes it one of the most special things we've ever done. It's all about our attitude, our attitude to the project and, and to one another, most of all. As we pulled out of the marina, we made our way out into the open ocean to meet the other boats at the start for the Atlantic Odyssey.
On day six of our sail, we finally felt it was calm enough to start some of our daily science of collecting water samples. So we took a grab sample from the ocean and because the mantatrol that we're using is 333 microns um, and so we only capture particles that are larger than 333 micron, we sort of made this device that would capture particles that are smaller than that. So the top net here is right in there, that one's 333 micron and then below that there's one that's 110, and below that there's one that's 20 micron. And then everything that passes through these would be less than uh, 20 micron. And so we can sample what has passed through and then also rinse the top of each filter to see if we have any particles that are that size. And then I can take them back to the lab to see what kind of particle sizes we have and then hopefully identify if there's any plastic in there as well. Getting used to life on board Sea Dragon was a slow process, especially for crew who had never sailed before. The weather kept us guessing, changing from bright sunlight to thunderstorms several times a day. But we were finally gathering speed and seem to be in the clear. All of a sudden, there was a snap and the sound of tearing. We looked forward to see that the jib sheet had broken and ripped a meter long tear in the stay sail, now catching dangerously in the wind. As we rushed to get it taken down, we knew we would need to repair the jib sheet the next day which meant our first mate, Shanley, would need to climb the forestay, a risky move in unpredictable weather. Wavy, cold, and wet. We were on night watch when lights appeared on the horizon between squalls. What's happening? So we're monitoring the ship right here that uh, Shanley spotted that was off our starboard bow. And, uh, Initially, it looked to be that they were on a collision course with us. So Emily got on the radio with them and they bought her course. So now I'm just checking to make sure that they are going to be uh, going behind us. Yeah, they're pretty close, aren't they? They were less than two nautical miles away. Oh. Yeah, you can see the lights are really close by now. Yeah. Upstairs. Called San Fernando. San Fernando. <laughs> Please don't run us over. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> that would not be a good end of the day. No. Because we're already having such a great week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm going to go do wake ups. I am about to go up in the bosun's chair on the fourth day to take off part of the jib sheet that is still on that uh, blew up yesterday while we were going upwind. Take it off and replace it so we can use the um, Should be exciting. I got my helmet, I got my tools. Oh goodness, koala bear time. <laughs> As we prepared for Shanley to climb the forest day, we were hopeful that despite the waves, she would be able to free the jib sheet. But we shouldn't have worried. She successfully removed the rope and we were soon on our way.
The rest of the morning was spent doing some very overdue housekeeping. We then decided the day had arrived to conduct our first trawling session. We needed to do quite a lot of prep at this stage, but once set up, it would be ready to trawl on a daily basis. <laughs> cool that one, camera. <laughs> We plan to deploy the trawl every day for 30 minutes according to the protocols of the Five Gyres Institute. Trawling, combined with water sampling, meant that we were conducting science for about four hours every day. All right, cool. If you want to unleash the beast. <laughs> Sneaky. It's ready! Yeah! Ready. Okay. Got a little bit of rain yeah. coming our way. All right. And uh, we're trying to get okay, trawling sorted. Set. Good. Good timing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're winners at that. We have impeccable timing. You, you should know this time. I know. The troll, you can see it um, just behind me here. We're now just going along at just over two knots. The surface of the water is always cutting straight into that aperture on the mantle troll. We have been adjusting the lines where necessary, but now it's pretty much set. Um, so we'll do this for 30 minutes, then we'll pull it forward again, lift it out, and check the sample. Similar to the design for water sampling, the trawl contents were rinsed through a set of three sieves of decreasing micron level. We recorded both plastic and biota, placing them into categories. In this first trawl, the plastic to biota ratio was one to 10. It was clear that as the microplastics and biota were of similar size, it would be virtually impossible for a fish to differentiate which was food and which was basically poison. Although the trawl had justified our expedition and mission across the ocean, we were still upset to find such an obvious presence of plastic. We decided that evening was as good as any to sit and talk through our body burden results. Studies have shown that humans have over 700 foreign synthetic chemicals in our bodies. Lucy explained what we had been tested for. We had quite a number of compounds analyzed. The first four are like chlorinated pesticides, brominated flame retardants, we've got a dioxin in there, and then a whole range of different analogues of PCBs. These are all fluorinated compounds which are akin to Teflon and surface treatments and carpet treatments, fabric treatments, that sort of thing. We had been tested for 30 key indicator chemicals and we found 29 of them. 
Lucy explained how these chemicals make their way into our bodies. For example, PBDEs, or flame retardants, that are commonly used on mattresses, carpets, and even clothing. These are then absorbed through the skin or inhaled and ingested. Although Lucy was able to answer many of our questions, she explained that upon arriving in Martinique, we would be able to get more detailed answers from Dr. Anna Carmen, a leading scientist in body burden analysis. In the early hours of the morning, our resident fish biologist and ecotoxicologist, Diana, found a stranded flying fish on deck. It was decided that we would dissect the fish to search for plastics in the digestive tract. Although some members of the crew were less than thrilled, Diana tried to help them understand. You have to think about the population and not the individual. A few individuals have to sacrifice for the good of all. <laughs> plastic in there. Sure, what do we got? How much on a boat's a boy? It's a boy, isn't it? <laughs> Good boys yeah. just want to get on this boat. They're leaping on this boat. <laughs> you could be a fish biologist. The liver is beautiful. Its pancreas is lovely. It's spleen. What a lovely little spleen. <laughs> it's got a, and it's got a darling testis. <laughs> oh, really? If it were exposed to things like PCBs, we'd find the enzymes that are used to metabolize that increased and those would be in the liver. Although we didn't find plastic in this particular sample, it raised pre-existing conversation on board about a very serious component of the plastics and toxics issue, the existence and impact of endocrine disrupting chemicals. As we watched several documentaries and Diana presented about EDCs, we learned that they are present in much of our daily lives from pesticides and additives to contaminants in food and personal care products. The whole beginning of the endocrine disrupting issue sort of came from observations of what was going on in the natural environment. During her 25 years at the US Geological Survey, Diana had specialized in contaminants and been a key player in telling the story of endocrine disruptors through what she'd seen in the Missouri River. As we listened and watched, we were seeing that the same chemicals that were present in our body burdens were causing changes to the reproductive organs, growth patterns, and developmental health of these animals. We had no doubt that the same could be said for human health. The World Health Organization states that EDCs are already suspected to be associated with increased incidence of breast cancer, altered reproductive functions, and abnormal developmental growth patterns in children. Soon enough, we got used to our daily routine on Sea Dragon. Every day from one till four in the afternoon, we would do science. Manta trawling, analysis, and water sampling were conducted. The samples would return with Jenna to the US, where they would be analyzed in her lab at the University of Georgia. General life had its ups and downs. Have you had better days? I've had better days. Just occupational hazard of making myself motion sick every time I film. <laughs> <laughs> As promised, every hour on the hour, 
day and night. We would fell out the log. So over the course of the sail, we logged our journey over 450 times. Days were filled with cooking, cleaning, sailing, science, and conversation. Perhaps one of the most important parts of our daily routine was gathering together each evening to hear one another's stories about life, work, challenges, hopes and dreams, and thoughts about our mission. We talked about science, from practical experiments to internal environmentalism, to the challenges faced by women in STEM careers. We explored the strengths and weaknesses of policy, society and industry, and how to effectively achieve behavior change. We learnt and celebrated the power of art and design in engaging citizens, improving not only their range of choices, but inspiring them to protect and respect their environment. We shared stories of love and loss, of lives cut short or devastated by cancer. These were stories of sadness and heartache, but also of strength a clear reminder of the outcomes of poor environmental and human health. We listened to epic tales of adventure and exploration and our connection with nature. Our determination to care for the world around us had brought us together. And on our final night on board, we reflected on what we were grateful for. I'm so thankful for, for all of you lot for being here. I mean, we had this dream um, <laughs> that seemed kind of crazy <laughs> about 18 months ago and you know, you were the ones who made it all happen. I'm also thankful for Sea Dragon. I want to give Sea Dragon yeah! a bit. Yeah! In the early hours of the 5th of December, the 19th day of our voyage, we spotted land. As we neared the shores of Martinique and lowered the mainsail, it finally began to sink in that we had done it. We had crossed the ocean. The next morning, Dr. Anna Carmen arrived from Sweden to discuss our body burden results in more detail. What our results showed was that no matter what age we were or where we were from, we had all been exposed to chemicals that have been shown to impact health without our knowledge. And although we had more questions than we had answers, we were still positive about moving forward. Most importantly, we talked about solutions, about the equally vital roles of society, policy, and industry 
to instigate and maintain lasting change. I think regulations and bans are very, very important. But then, of course, if you want to do more, if you want to do anything else, then as a consumer, you, you still have power to, to make choices. I guess that's the root of everything. During our final hours together, we talked about how this voyage is only the start of a much bigger mission. Do you have a sense of optimism? I, I do, yes. That's why I do this work. <laughs>
on big problems like the Missouri River. Um, you're working with lots of really dynamic people. Um, you take yourself out of that and you really miss it. So I was looking for a community again, uh, people that shared similar passions that I had. And I just happened to see this um, on a listserv that they were looking for people to go on this expedition. I had never sailed before. And, uh, but I knew about endocrine disrupting chemicals and so I filled a, a niche for them. Wow. Yeah. Uh, second question is, is um, what, um, what has been the results of your studies? Have you, have you published them or are you going to publish them? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll show you some of the results. We, um, we, we haven't published yet. Um, there are, we want to combine several of our trips together. Um, but much of our data has been incorporated into larger data sets. When we came across the ocean, we used um, something called the Marine Debris Tracker, which is an app that you can put on your phone or on, on an iPad. And you can log in all of the plastic that you see visually on the, on the surface of the ocean. So what we wound up with was a track of the, the big pieces, um, which is used by, the app was actually uh, developed by NOAA. And many people around the country, mostly citizen scientists, are using this app to uh, look at the spatial distribution of plastic and, and trying to understand how it goes from a coast into these gyres, what currents are taking it where, and where it's winding up. One of the things that I failed to mention early on was that although we estimate 8 million metric tons of plastic are going into the ocean, what they've been able to visually account for is only 250,000 um, pounds. So there's a lot missing. <laughs> where is it? Um, yeah, so that, that's, there's this big question and, and some of it is breaking down and we're not, you know, we just haven't quantified it all yet, but we, we certainly don't understand yet where, where it's all going. So trips like ours that didn't visit a gyre necessarily, and in fact purposely, we were trying to go in between gyres to see where you might find, or if you might find plastic in other places. And um, yeah, so over 2,850 2, miles, we found, um, we found macroplastic, the big, the big stuff, um, but we found just, I, here's some of our, our data that we saw, um, 15 pieces of, of total plastic, um, just floating on that 2014 trip. On a second trip that we made in 2015, we saw a lot more, 465 pieces of uh, plastic floating on, on the ocean. And then another trip up the length of the, um, from Brazil up to Guyana, we saw another 92 pieces. But in the trawls that we were doing, um, we caught a total, we caught, we, we fished a total of 33 pieces of plastic on that particular trip. And it's pretty unnerving to set a, a net like that out in the middle of the ocean, thousands of miles from land, drag it for 30 minutes, and you saw how small it was. 30 minutes and pull it up and have even five pieces of blue and pink and white plastic in it. You just just don't expect that. Um, but it's not uncommon. Um, more and more expeditions like this are going out there and documenting this kind of um, plastic uh, occurring. Um, regarding that app, one of the things that, as Mer Missouri River Relief people, you can um, appreciate is that more and more we're, we're trying to understand 
what's out there, what, where is it coming from, and so that we can then try and regulate it. And I've been looking at how we might be able to use this NOAA app, Marine Debris Tracker, to be able to look at it in our rivers. And this year I'll be doing more of it through um, working with Missouri River Relief and trying to um, log in plastic. At some point I hope that I can make that procedure more available to everybody so that we can, we can start looking at what's making it to the Gulf. And um, a lot of it is going to the bottom, um, we know that but a lot of it's probably going all the way down. Those smaller bits that are floating um, are making their way. And in fact, um, a little bit of research has been done on this so far in the Danube. They're seeing as much as four tons a day of small pieces of plastic. This is five millimeters and smaller pieces of plastic. They, they did the same kind of thing that we did with a very fine mesh net, but they set those up across the mouth of the Danube at the, at the confluence with the Black Sea. And they, um, they actually did quantify how much of this microplastic was entering into the sea. So we know it's happening. We, you know, it's out there, it's out there in our river. Um, it's getting into our, our fish and wildlife, surely. Uh, we just don't know the extent of the problem. Uh, I'll take a few more questions. Sounds like we just need to make plastic heavier. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, I'm upside out of mind. Okay, of all the people that went on this trip, you all kind of suspected that there was something. What was your biggest surprise or your biggest aha, something that you didn't expect or realize before you took this trip? Uh, just in general or science? Uh, I didn't know that I could live with, <laughs> honestly, I, didn't, I did not know that I could um, be with nine other women for in that small space <laughs> for that let 20 days. Uh, and honestly, it was, uh, a lot of people said that, that they, they, they were surprised that they could, with no arguments, no, I mean, it was a very enjoyable trip despite, you know, the hardships of it. Um, it was, it, it was a wonderful trip. So that was the biggest surprise for me. <laughs> And then I didn't get seasick at all, wow. at all. In fact, I loved it. It was like being on a roller coaster. <laughs> what about on the science side? Um, on the science side, I I really didn't expect to catch to find plastic like that. Um, I you know I spent a lot of my time below in my head in the microscope. Um, because the, the samples would be collected and then they were sent down to me to sort them out. And I was surprised when I would be picking through that I would see in, my, in the same field in the microscope um, a fish whose mouth was just the right size, you know, as the piece of plastic that was sitting there in the Petri dish with it. And it just, it, it just hits you that as a fish is moving through, these baby fish are moving through the water, that they're going to encounter these things and surely they're going to go after them. Makes you start thinking about, you know, the vastness of the ocean and pelagic fish when they're, um, they, they have lots and lots of offspring because so many of them die for natural reasons. They're eaten or they can't find anything to eat. And here they are, the little bits and pieces that they think they're finding to eat wind up being a waste of energy. Um, so how much is that contributing to their demise? You know, it's just one more thing. So yeah, that was, that was a, a shock. Like McDonald's for fish? <laughs> If there's enough biofilm on there and, and uh, yeah, and, and bacteria and things, they might, 
if they can pass it, <laughs> they might be able to get some nutrition out of it. You know, it's, it's such a huge space, and to even find one piece, and, and it seems like, well, a square kilometer, I mean, that's a large, but yeah. not when you're talking about how big the Atlantic Ocean is. Right. I, I was just reading, recently reading about pesticides in the uh, lowest parts of the ocean where, you know, they figured nothing could go. And some of those might be now attaching them itself. <laughs> those chemicals might be binding to these plastics and raining down as well. Um, as well as being in the biota that's falling to the bottom. In terms of your best guess, converting to public policy, mm -hmm. will it be at least three more decades before this gets to a level of awareness? Um, I Knowing what you know yeah. and that we need to be acting, the second part of this is, in terms of being a good citizen, what would be your top three things to consider, given that we have endocrine disruptor problems yeah. and all of the uptake that's happening at a microorganism uh, level? Yeah. I think the first thing is, is very encouraging that more and more communities, cities, states, and countries are banning plastic bags. Plastic bags are, are really one of the worst things. Um, and everything's packaged in plastic. It is, it is. And uh, I'm seeing more interest on the part of engineers and product designers. One of the women on that trip was a product designer, an Italian one, and her company that she's working with was uh, trying to develop new packaging that would break down. Um, so it's a, it's a growing field and one that I think is becoming recognized as, as, as necessary to, to substitute. Right now, for instance, um, you may or may not have heard about in um, Peru, there's um, really heavy rains um, occurring. Well, they don't have the best uh, waste management systems. And some of the worst areas for um, uh, drainage and, and flooding are occurring because all this plastic trash is, is blocking um, some of the drainages. And, and people are dying because of this. And so if you combine the two problems of the changing in the climate that we're going to be seeing, you know, worse and worse um, storm events and more frequent, and then on top of that, this refuse problem, especially in countries that don't have the more modern ability to, to do something with it. Again, that's why internationally that you see a lot of effort being put into um, just getting good waste management, you know, um, taken care of. So I think waste management, I think changing from plastic, and then, uh, like you're saying, our own um, behaviors and changing those behaviors. I, I try very hard to always take my cup with me, you know. Um, I even carry now a, a spoon and a fork. Um, you just, you have to make it part of your lifestyle until there are good substitutes. Because that, that, the worst thing, I mean, we're always going to have some kind of plastic. I mean, it's going to be unavoidable, but the worst thing is the single-use plastic. It, it's just horrible. Um, yeah, the, the plastic bags and, and the, and the single-use plastics are right up on top there. Um, I think we do need to have more research into understanding more about the plastic getting into the food chain and if that's truly a threat. I know myself, I mean, I probably eat five, six apples a week. Maybe one of those, I forget, and I eat that little label on there, that's plastic. <laughs> Is it killing me? <laughs> I hope to heck not. <laughs> Um, so, you, you know, we need to understand how much ingesting plastics really doing us and wildlife. 
um, harm if we're going to go the route of you know, trying to do something about it, because it is a lot of money to deal with it. They're looking at now what's coming through the sewage treatment plants, and that's something I'm very interested in up in um, Columbia. We have a sewage treatment plant that uses um, a wetland as part of the process. Um, I want to look at what might be coming through that. We do know that tiny fibers are coming through. They're getting down into the muds where you have important uh, macroinvertebrates that most of them are filter feeders. So it's just passing that stuff through. How much of those are then being wiped out because of this? Um, and you know that it, that is important for fish, for other invertebrates that then become part of the the food chain and food web. So um, we've got a lot to do there to understand that. But meanwhile, we could be doing a huge amount by being willing to make those changes to fight the. Um, the PACs that are trying to prevent people from deciding as a community, no, we're not going to have plastic bags anymore. You know, that's it. Um, to look for um, opportunities to, um, to use recycled plastics and get, get recycled plastics, um, the mater raw material, have that be used more so if there's a market. That's really important, too. Um, so, yeah. You know, the, uh, we're constantly fighting this battle of unintended consequences of things that we do that produce things that we had no idea that would happen. And how we adapt to those consequences is really what we're looking at in our future and, and what our, our future will be. Uh, I did read a story about uh, settlers on the plastic islands in the Pacific. <laughs> they were, uh, I mean, there's the do-nothing scenario, there's the pay-attention scenario, and then there's what Diana's doing, and that's figuring out what's going on scenario. And uh, so often we want to uh, ignore the things that are going to uh, tell us we can't do what we want to do. And pretending it's not there, I mean, what? You can stick your head in the sand. It's still there. I was also interested in your comment about the fibers from Patagonia products. Patagonia for years has been known as being environmentally conscious. Yeah. And I'm sure as they heard that that was happening, that they're in the process of cleaning up that issue around, yeah. what was the fiber in the fleece? Is it fleece? Yeah, it's a, it's a plastic, it's a polymer. Yeah, I mean, they hung their hat on being environmentally. They're, they were horrified when they, they actually funded the study, um, and now they're looking at alternatives to that. In fact, you know, people are going back so much more now to, whoa, it'll break down. I, I believe in the meantime, they've at least labeled mm -hmm. their clothes Have to warn you of what the consequences are. Yeah, and then people have come up with bags that you can put the fleece products in to wash them in the washing machine. Um, kind of like your lint trap in your dryer, I think. So there are starting to be some, how can we live without fleece, right? <laughs>You mentioned the micro beads in, yeah. I get, is that in some of the soaps? I, yeah, it is. Oops. I, I haven't heard of that before. Oh, yeah. They're in the soaps. Um, they're in toothpaste, so you're eating them. Um, they're in um, abrasives for um, scrubs. Um, they're, you know, they're in industrial products, too. But the, the more frightening ones are the ones, and they, they actually can have a really important value in that um, they carry things that you want them to carry. In paints, they carry pigment. Um, in medicines, the even smaller particles, the nanoparticles, carry antibiotics. Um, they're used in cancer treatment to be able to target um, in the medicines that they give you directly to the, to the um, so there's, you know, they, they had a 
good purpose, I think, in the original design, but now they're just used ubiquitously and for no reason. Um, and they're, they're making their way into our environment. Are, are those included in the labels of those soaps? So we know, can we look at a label and some know do, which soaps not to use? Some do and some don't, but you can, they're, they're, um, they're eliminating them because they've outlawed them oh, okay. in, many, in many places. Canada, I think 2018, they'll be gone. The UK, they're, they're disappearing. I forget what, if it's this year maybe, that they're gonna be eliminated from certain products here, but other products will still have them. So you, you need to look. Um, you can usually find out by doing a little bit of searching on the internet. Yeah. Uh, another question is, your trip was a very small portion of the ocean, yeah. and you had really insightful results. Are there other countries, other agencies doing similar studies to try to bring all this together? Yeah, one of the, um, we, it was mentioned about five gyres. It's a research institute, another nonprofit that, um, it studies specifically this, the, the five gyres that are out there and how microplastics and larger plastic is getting into um, the ocean. Um, Woods Hole, NOAA, um, has a huge uh, effort just on marine debris. Um, the UN, it's, it's very, very big. Uh, lots of people are studying it, and because people that live in coastal areas, um, oftentimes tourism is occurring in those areas and it's a big um, revenue uh, for those communities, they have to have clean beaches. Well, the trash, it used to be you'd walk along the beach and you'd pick up shells and sea glass. Now all you see is, is plastic. Um, so there's a lot going on with citizens going up, cleaning up their beaches, and in the process, um, looking at this plastic and trying to understand where it's coming from and, um, and, and becoming more educated about just the whole disposable situation with plastics. And it's been a great way, just like Missouri River Relief has been a great opportunity for people to get out in the environment and see what this is, you know, the consequences of, of um, trash is on the, the aesthetics and the health of our rivers. Um, people in coastal areas have been doing the same kind of thing now, yeah. Has there been an effective method um uh, found to clean up microplastics in sandy beaches? I wouldn't say it's a, it's, everything I've seen so far has been really labor intensive. Um, there are people that go out there with these giant sieves and sieve the sand. Um, it's, I wouldn't say there's anything that's very effective in terms of of people's time, but because it's a again a really great activity, um, you can get a lot of people involved in it. Um, in the ocean, however, that's a different story. There is a lot of um, media attention put on a single young man from the Netherlands named Boyne Slat. And as a, I think, high school student, he de engineered and, and designed this trap to put into the oceans to start collecting the microplastic. And after, now I think it's probably been about eight years of getting funding and working on the designs, I think they're piloting um, this thing this year. And it looks like a big funnel and it, these will be just, I think it's covering a couple of kilometers that they're gonna, where the currents come in, and they're gonna start trying to collect some of the um, trash entering these gyres to, and put it onto a barge. But they've estimated that just cleaning up one gyre with this method would take 10 years.
constantly working at it. But that presupposes that we get rid of <laughs> what's coming down the stream. So um, no, there are there aren't good. That's why so much effort's going into stopping the waste stream. There aren't good methods to get rid of it once it's out there. And the big pieces just keep breaking down. So I did have um, a little bit on what our results were. Um, we all had our blood um, tested, as, as they said. And we, we were really quite pleased to see chlorinated pesticide, DDET, and its metabolite, DDE. And these are picograms from 1,000 to 6,000 picograms of the, of the DDT per mill of serum. And this is about where you'd want to, you know, see it and where it probably, for the majority of us, was. But we had a few individuals. This woman, 65 years old, um, had the highest, and we would expect that. She's a Londoner, and she was alive when we had the most of this stuff being used and was probably exposed to it pretty heavily when she was young. Um, one of the other interesting compounds that we found that was very much related to um, sailing activities and to um, plastic materials is flame retardants, polybrominated diphenyl ethers. They're finding them out in the Missouri River. We can go out and collect sturgeon out there and they'll have PBDs in them. They're actually, as our PCBs and our chlorinated pesticides are going down, PBDEs are starting to go up. Um, where we're finding, um, so we're finding more and more of these things there. They put them a lot in electronics as well to keep them from going up in flames. Um, so we're seeing you know, we're seeing a similar kind of trend where the majority, the majority of the women were quite, quite young that were on this trip, and they're, they're making very healthy choices in what they eat, in their lifestyle, and we have good laws. I mean, the, most of these women are from um, European countries where they have environmental protections and environmental regulations, and this is the result. Um, this one woman here that was extraordinarily high, she had spent, it was Emily, our um, skipper and co-founder of X Expedition, she had been spent, she had spent five years out on, I'm forgetting which um, Pacific Island it was, helping those islanders deal with their trash, especially their electronic trash. And they had been burning it for a long time. And she was trying to get them to set up a system where once a year a barge would come and, and off take all this stuff off the island. But as a result, it showed up into her blood um, from the, uh, yeah, so she wound up with the highest concentration of PBD. It was really eerie to be able to link our behavior to what we saw in our, in our blood um, situation. Um, let's see what else, PCBs. Um, again, the oldest woman had that, had, had the PCB in her blood that was high. These are an interesting group of compounds too, perfluorinated chemicals. Again, these are the kinds of chemicals that we were interested in were those that persist in the environment um, and the kind that would adsorb and stay on pieces of plastic. Um, the perfluorinated compounds are in Teflon, they're in Gore-Tex, they're all of us that use uh, camping equipment. Our tents are covered with it, our raincoats and rain gear is covered in it. Um, and it turns out that the gal who spends most of her time at sea, our first mate, Shan Lee, had the highest concentrations of PFAS. Um, so even though she was one of the youngest women um, on the on the ship, she uh, she winds up she winds up with the highest PFOS. So it's you know it is about decisions. It's about um, you know what are we what are we gonna allow? Um, what do we need in life? You know what what kinds of compounds 
And how dangerous are these? They're, they're doing more and more work on these kinds of compounds. They affect the thyroid. They do affect the reproductive system in our model animals. We don't have um, a, a lot of information yet on what it means for, for humans, but more and more we're seeing that the models do predict fairly well um, and show that you can expect some portion of our population will have um, adverse effects from, from some of these chemicals. So yeah, um, that's pretty much what I came to tell you about and start counting the plastic out there. <laughs> pretty soon you'll be able to log it in real time and and contribute to the uh, information base about what's coming down our river and potentially going into the Gulf. Carry this burden love.